Yeah. 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 I'd like to call the hearing to order this morning. I know we are going to have some votes. This is a very important hearing, and we certainly want to uh, to uh, give everyone an opportunity to give their opening statement, ask questions. And today's hearing is about H.R. 906, a bill to modify the efficiency standards for grid-enabled water heaters. Many of you may remember uh, uh, a group, singing group called Dire Straits. And they had this marvelous song, uh, Money for Nothing and the Chicks Are Free. And in the lyrics of that song, they talked about uh, moving and selling microwave ovens, refrigerators, and color TVs. And we know in today's world, you can't uh, sell a microwave oven or a color TV or a refrigerator or anything else without a government dictating what's in the product. So we find ourselves in a world where the government is really micromanaging through regulations, every, really everything in our society, whether we're talking about health care or the requirements for a community bank to make to a farmer in Kentucky to make a loan. Uh, so, and now today, uh, last March, I guess it was, the uh, Department of Energy came out with a regulation about hot water heaters. So we're here today to, to, to discuss a bill that will bring regulatory relief to many electricity providers, manufacturers, and consumers across the country. There are approximately, approximately 250 electric cooperatives in 34 states that utilize these large <coughs> electric resistance water heaters in demand response programs to help with reliability and consumer costs during peak periods of energy use. As I said, the department issued this uh, new efficiency standard in March of 2010, and uh, th they're prohibiting the manufacture of water heaters that are 55 gallons or larger if they're electric resistant heaters, and they're mandating that they go to a heat pump um, technology. So, uh, you know, I, all of us here in Congress, we have groups come in all the time talking about the government's controlling what kind of fan motor you can have, what kind of light bulb you can have, whatever. Uh, this is one of those issues that I, I think just about every member of Congress agrees that uh, when you're interfering with demand response programs, it's uh, counterproductive. So hopefully uh, we can uh, introduce this bill, and if people want to try to amend it or whatever, do regular order and, and try to bring some relief to the American consumer. Uh, I get really excited when I think about hot water heaters, and I'd like to say more, but right now I'm going to, <laughs> I'm going to yield one minute to Mr. Latta of Ohio. Well, I appreciate the chairman for yielding, and you're absolutely right. We, we all love uh, those hot water heaters when they, uh, you get in there in the shower in the morning. But, uh, Mr. Chairman, thanks again for having this very important hearing today to discuss uh, this, uh, this very important legislation to modify the efficiency standards for grid-enabled water heaters. I'm pleased to be a co-sponsor of the legislation. I hope the committee can advance the legislation quickly, as you said, that there's great bipartisan support. The rural electric cooperatives are very important in my district. They provide power to agriculture and manufacturing operations that are important to the local, state, national, and global economy. And in fact, I have seven rural electric co-ops in my district, and all seven use voluntary demand response programs to reduce peak demand, increase the use of renewable energy, and decrease costs to the consumer. This legislation permits the continued manufacturing of electric resistant water heaters above 75 gallons for use in thermal energy storage and demand response programs. Enabling the manufacturing of these water heaters is vital for the demand response programs. I look forward to today's testimony, Mr. Chairman, and I yield back, and I appreciate it. Thank you. The gentleman yields back, and then uh, at this time I'd like to recognize the gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Rush, for his opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I want to thank you for holding this hearing. Mr. Chairman, my first uh, request is uh, for unanimous consent. We'd like to hear you sing that song uh, that you mentioned. I object. <laughs> I object. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, Mr. Chairman, I, I, I really want to, uh, as you know, I've been unavoidably absent, and I want to thank 
uh, Mr. My friend from California, Mr. McNerney, uh, he's not here right now for uh, sitting in the chair for me during my absence. And I want to also thank you, Mr. Chairman, for holding today's hearing on this very important bill, H.R. 906. Uh, this is a straightforward bill that seeks to modify the Department of Energy's efe energy efficiency standards regarding low capacity electric resistant water heaters in order to allow the continual manufacture and use of re electric resistant water heaters above 75 gallons of, for use in thermal energy storage and demand response, response programs. And as I understand it, Mr. Chairman, <clears throat> the 2010 Energy Efficiency Standard issued by uh, the Department under the Energy Policy and Conservation Act required nearly 200 percent efficiency for large capacity electric resistant water heaters for those manufactured after April 16, 2015. Supporters of H.R. 906, such as the National Rural Electric Cooperative Association argued that the rule as drafted will effectively prohibit the continual manufacture of large capacity electric resistant water heaters, which would then have to be replaced by heat pumps that are not compatible with certain utility thermal energy storage and demand uh, response programs. So, Mr. Chairman, as you can see, this is a very important hearing, and I look forward to hearing the testimony from uh, the witness, expert witnesses today. And with that, I yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman yields back. Unless, uh, unless somebody wants to use the time. All right. Uh, I tell you what, if y'all wouldn't mind, uh, I'll recognize you all for five minutes, and you can split it up the way you want to. Is that okay? Okay. All right. Is there anyone on our side that would like to make any comments about this bill? Okay. Then, uh, Mr. Welch, I'll recognize you for five minutes. Well, uh, I, ca I can't match your lyrics, uh, but I can agree with everything you said and my colleague, Mr. Lada. Uh, you know, the Department of Energy does really good stuff, and I actually think standards are a very important tool. Uh, but we also have to have it match what realistically can be done in order to get the benefit. Uh, of demand response, uh, and there's a lot of homes that have these water heaters that are going to benefit and it's going to save folks money. So the regulation, I think, has to have as a goal the maximum deployment and the maximum energy efficiency, and I think that's what is uniting uh, us in this effort here. Uh, I'm like Congressman Lada. I mean, the, the local uh, uh, cooperatives are fantastic <clears throat> and really a lifeline for a lot of our citizens in rural areas. And uh, homeowners are doing everything they can to try to save money on their bills. They don't need. They don't need. Uh, they need an opportunity, but they they uh, uh, they know that less is more if they can save some money. And then when they have their cooperative working with them in this demand response, uh, that actually integrates uh, this opportunity of savings with the technology that people actually have in their homes. Uh, let's take advantage of it. So this is great bipartisan legislation, and I'm hopeful that. Uh, uh, we can get this done, and I appreciate, Mr. Chairman uh, and, and Mr. Ranking Member, your, your uh, cooperation on this and leading the committee. Thank you. I yield back. Did you want to yield to Mr. Lobsack? Or? I yield to Mr. Lobsack. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Welch. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, my wife often refers to me as uh, what Second City used to call mainstream challenged. And uh, <laughs> I don't know if you know what I'm talking about or not. Uh, that, probably means that I really am mainstream challenge if I'm the only one who knows what I'm talking about. But uh, talking about water heater, heaters, I think, puts me in the mainstream, and talking about dire straits really does. Uh, I'd love to hear you sing, Mr. Chairman, but I'd like to have Sting accompany you as he, as he does on that song that you mentioned. Um, but it is great to be here. Uh, it's really wonderful because this is a bipartisan effort, something that the American public and everyone in this room uh, knows happens all too infrequently. Uh, here in the U.S. Capitol, here in Washington, D.C. Uh, a problem was recognized, and a problem is going to get rectified with this legislation. And also, uh, on a bipartisan basis, uh, we're here to uh, really recognize the importance of, of, these, of these rural electric cooperatives as well. You know, they date back a long ways to the 1930s in Iowa, certainly, and, and about 15 percent of our population is served by these RECs now. 
and I visit as many of them as I possibly can. Uh, I've had meetings. They've let me hold meetings there, not just to go see what they have to do, but so I can talk to other folks as well. But they get it. They understand how to service the population uh, in these rural areas. And so uh, their concerns, I think, need to be our concerns. And that's in large part why, why we have this legislation today. So I thank you, Mr. Chair, and thanks, thank all those folks on a bipartisan basis who've joined together on this, and I do look forward to your testimony. Thank you. And I yield back to Mr. Welch. Okay, uh, the yield back. Uh, that concludes the opening statements. Now, I've just been notified that we have two votes on the House floor right now, and uh, they've already started t 10 minutes left in the first vote. So we're going to recess, and then when we come back, we really look forward to the testimony of you four gentlemen because you all uh, are very much uh, aware of the ramifications of this legislation, the impact of the regulation as well. So we look forward to that. And uh, did you want to say anything? Oh, okay. Okay, okay. So we'll recess, and hopefully we'll be back within about uh, 15 or 20 minutes. So thank you all for your patience. I'm sorry for the interruption, but we'll be uh, back as soon as we can.
I'd like to call the hearing back to order, and we do expect some of the other members to be here shortly. Uh, as I said, we have a great panel of witnesses. I want to thank all of you for coming, and uh, I'm just going to introduce you individually as you prepare to give your statement. So our first witness this morning is uh, Gary Conant, who is the Director for Member Services and Demand Side Management at the Great River Energy uh, uh, entity and so Mr. Connett uh, you're recognized for five minutes and I would just ask all of you to pull the microphone up close enough so that we can hear you clearly and uh, thank you for being with us Mr. Connett and thank you uh, Chairman Whitfield and, and members of the subcommittee thank you for inviting me to testify today on legislation to protect grid enabled water heaters you mentioned my name. My name is Gary Connett, Director of Demand Side Management at Great River Energy, a generation and transmission cooperative that serves 28 member retail distribution cooperatives in Minnesota and northwestern Wisconsin. And I, by the way, am one of these people that actually has one of these water heaters that we're talking about today. I want to thank the subcommittee for addressing this important and timely issue. Large capacity electric resistance water heaters are essential demand response tools for electric cooperatives. Immediate action is needed to mitigate the impacts of a 2010 Department of Energy Efficiency Rule and help maintain our ability to use these water heaters in voluntary demand response programs. The DOE rule, which goes into effect on April 16th, as you mentioned, effectively bans the manufacture of electric resistance water heaters with this storage capacity of over 55 gallons. As manufacturers prepare to shut down production lines, this widely supported legislation is urgently needed. The electric industry is searching for a low-cost battery to store electricity. At Great River Energy, we think we have it. It's in the basements of nearly 100,000 homes in Minnesota. It charges each night and discharges every day in the form of hot water. It does this night after night, year after year, storing and discharging over 1,000 megawatt hours every day. I would argue that it might be the largest battery in the upper Midwest. And this battery consists precisely of the same water heaters that the DOE wants to ban. Through demand response programs offered by electric cooperatives, these super-insulated, high-efficient water heaters store low-cost off-peak energy, which is available during the nighttime hours. We store it in the form of hot water. They allow for the better utilization of renewable energy and more efficient operation of the electric grid. More importantly, these water heaters play an important role in cooperatives' efforts to provide its member owners with safe, reliable, and affordable electric energy. Even when not tied to renewable energy, cooperatives across the country use these water heaters to reduce demand for electricity during peak hours, which would otherwise be uh, served by additional and less efficient electric generators. Today, over 250 cooperatives across the country are engaged in voluntary demand response programs using these large capacity water heaters. They are one of the best tools cooperatives have for integrating renewable energy and encouraging demand response and improving system reliability. So on April 16th, a new energy efficiency standard will take effect. This standard will require all large capacity electric water heaters to operate at about 200% efficiency, a level that only heat pump water heaters can achieve. While heat pump water heaters are energy efficient, they don't work so well with utility demand response programs, and they don't work so well in cold climates such as Minnesota. The DOE, despite its good intentions, was unaware of the impact that its rule would have on utilities demand response programs. However, due to regulatory hurdles, the DOE has not been able to resolve this issue. In great cooperative fashion, the National Rural Electric Cooperative Association worked with a large stakeholder group to come up with a legislative solution that will not only help protect these water heaters, but will also advance water heater technology by establishing criteria for grid-enabled water heaters. The widespread stakeholder support for this solution should make it an easy decision to pass this urgent legislation. H.R. 906 doesn't repeal the DOE standard but rather permits the continued manufacture of large capacity water heaters above 75 gallons for use in demand response programs. The legislation includes language to prevent these water heaters from entering the market unless they are used in utility demand response programs. As the subcommittee is aware, the consensus legislation has been incorporated into numerous pieces of energy efficiency legislation in both the House and the Senate over the past two years. Last March, the House passed H.R. 2126, the Energy Efficiency Improvement Act, by an overwhelming vote of 375 to 36. 
Three of the four titles of H.R. 2126 were recently attached to S-1, a bill to approve the Keystone Pipeline, a bill that passed both the House and Senate in this Congress, but was vetoed for reasons unrelated to the water heater title. In summary, H.R. 906 is a good bill. It fixes things to everyone's liking. On behalf of Great River Energy and the other cooperatives across the nation who face the threat to this new DOE standard, I want to thank Chairman Whitfield and Representative Welch, as well as Representatives Lada, Lobsack, Kramer, and Doyle for their leadership on the current legislation and persistence in seeing it through. Thank you. Um, Mr. Conant, thank you very much for your statement. And at this time, uh, I'd like to recognize Stephen Cope, who's the uti utility sales manager at the Vaughn Thermal Corporation and the Vaughn Electric Water Heaters. Thank you very much for being with us uh, this morning, and we look forward to your five minutes of testimony. And, and if you wouldn't mind, turn it on and get it up closer so that we can hear okay, it. Okay, am I coming through? Yes, sir. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, good morning, and thank you, uh, Chairman Whitfield, Ranking Member Rush, members of the subcommittee. Thank you for inviting me today. Um, my name is Steve Kep. I'm the National Utility Sales Manager at Vaughn Thermal Corporation. Uh, we manufacture electric water heaters in Salisbury, Massachusetts. We also manufacture a wide range of water heating and electronic control technologies. I would like to thank the subcommittee for addressing this important issue and for inviting me here today. Uh, Vaughn has been in the business of manufacturing high-efficiency, long-life electric water heaters for electric utility programs for over 50 years. Uh, we are an active member of, of AHRI, and, and as such, I, I'm here to represent Vaughn, but also uh, the other water heater manufacturers who supported the, the legislative effort, and that would be uh, A.O. Smith and Ream and General Electric, who are all part of that stakeholder group. Uh, following the general outline of my written testimony, I'd like to touch on some pertinent uh, questions and topics. Uh, first is you know, why the urgency? Uh, it's been almost five years since the final rule was, was announced, and it has been two years since DOE uh, held a meeting on the uh, proposed rulemaking to establish a waiver process to address the concerns of the electric utility industry. As we've heard, the DOE, the DOE rule will most certainly cause the erosion of existing demand response resources, resources that by DOE's own admission the country needs and the country wants. Secondly, uh, why are we all so concerned about this fraction of a fraction of the electric water heating market? Uh, while large capacity residential electric resistance water heaters make up less than 5% of the electric water heating market, they are more than 90% of what gets installed in utility demand response programs. That's why they're so important. As you know, the, uh, the legislation contains the provision for a grid-enabled product classification. Uh, I, I feel it's important to point out that utilities, manufacturers, and public policy organizations, all of those represented here today, all support this legislation. This is as close as we can get to unanimous support on any utility industry issue. Uh, in addition, there is an activation key provision uh, within, the, uh, within the legislation that will equate to a very low likelihood of leakage for these products through traditional wholesale and, and retail channels. Uh, in, in previous presentations on this issue, I have used the phrase, change the technology or change the source energy. It's, it's fair to characterize the DOE approach as change the technology since efficiency uh, gains will lead to reduced carbon emissions. But it's also true that changing the source energy, maximizing the renewable input to these appliances, reduces carbon as much or more. Uh, we need to pursue both strategies simultaneously. It needs to be and, not or. We need to change the technology and change the source energy. And by doing so, we have the unique opportunity to double the carbon reduction potential in the electric water heating market. That's exciting. I think it's fair to look at this as a renewable storage opportunity. Uh, again, a, a phrase that I've used, what happens when the forgotten appliance meets the Internet of Things? You get the grid-enabled water heater. High-speed two-way communication to this appliance um, and aggregation on the scale of, of the Great River Energy Program, which means we have the, the potential for the largest aggregated interactive thermal battery probably on the face of the earth. Uh, I'm sure you're all familiar with the issues of curtailed wind and spilled hydro. In this country, we have excess, low-cost and no-cost renewable energy that goes for the asking at certain times of the year and certain times of the day. So uh, please remember that electric thermal storage is the low-hanging fruit when it comes to renewable storage and electric storage technologies. ETS storage is one-tenth the cost of batteries or flywheels. 
in summary, um, I just want to touch briefly on, on the market potential or the potential market impact of grid-enabled water heaters. Uh, the electric, um, within this country, there's over 50 million installed electric water heaters in households across the country. Roughly 4 million of those are replaced annually. That money is being spent, that investment is being made on an annual basis. If we could divert or convert 10% of the annual turnover to grid-enabled water heaters, that would be 400,000 water heaters a year. That would be like implementing four Great River Energy programs on an annual basis. But you know, the, the, the potential here is, is, is very large. And as I said, the investment is being made. We could do this for just the incremental cost of the controls. The tanks are being manufactured and sold and installed every year uh, to, uh, to replace the water heaters that are failing. Um, historically, my personal experience has taught me that timing is everything. So if, if you know, doing the wrong thing at the right time or any other time isn't going to get us where we want to go, even the right thing at the wrong time doesn't help. We need to do the right thing at the right time, and this legislation is the right thing at the right time. So I want to thank you for the opportunity to visit with you today, and I welcome any questions you may have. Uh, thanks very much, Mr. Cope. At this time, I'd like to introduce Mr. Steve Nadell, who's the Executive Director of the American Council for an Energy Efficient Economy. Thanks for being with us, and you're recognized for five minutes. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Ranking Member, other members of the uh, committee. As you noted, I'm with the American Council for an Energy Efficient Economy. We're a nonprofit research organization that works on technologies, programs, and policies to advance energy efficiency. We've been doing this for 35 years now, and over this period, substantial progress has been made on energy efficiency, uh, due in part to uh, uh, strong bipartisan support uh, from uh, Congress. As you, uh, Mr. Chairman, stated at a previous hearing I uh, testified at, uh, no one is in favor of energy waste. Uh, I am here today, like the other witnesses, to testify in support of H.R. 906. Water heating is a major use of home energy uh, use, uh, second only to space heating. For homes with electric water heating, the water heater is generally the single largest electricity user. Due to the high cost of water heaters, they were included as part of federal energy efficiency standards passed by Congress in 1987 and signed by President Reagan. Congress set the initial standards and DOE periodically revises these standards based on criteria that Congress established. A 2012 analysis estimates that the standards already enacted on water heaters as well as other products are saving consumers and businesses in the U.S. a cumulative trillion dollars. So these are enormous uh, savings, not million, not billion, uh, trillion. Um, in 2010, as we've already heard, after a multi-step rulemaking process, uh, uh, DOE established new efficiency standards for water heaters that take effect next month. The standards apply at the point of manufacture and do not affect water heaters already in houses or in the sales distribution system. The new standards require moderate efficiency improvements in water heaters with a storage capacity of 55 gallons or less, but much larger efficiency improvements in both electric and gas water heaters, over 55 gallons. I would note that 50 gallons is the average electric water heater, so these only apply above uh, the stronger standards, above that. Households with very large water heaters use more hot water on average, making higher efficiency levels uh, cost effective. Uh, when DOE established the standards, it estimated that the average household with a very large electric water heater would save over $600 over the life cycle of their high efficiency uh, unit. Now, as we've heard, many electric cooperatives as well as some other utilities have long sponsored programs to use water heaters to heat and store hot water during off-peak periods, such as overnight, permitting lower uh, energy use during peak periods. These programs help utilities manage their systems by reducing peak loads. A timer, a radio control, or other type of communication device controls the water heaters to generally stop them from operating during peak periods. After DOE issued the, the rule in 2010, some utilities realized that the very large uh, electric resistance water heaters they sometimes use in demand response and thermal storage programs would no longer be manufactured. Um, there are heat pump water heaters, but these have not yet been fully evaluated and field tested for use in demand response and thermal storage uh, programs. To address these concerns, as we've all heard, uh, many organizations uh, uh, negotiated the language in uh, H.R. Uh, 906, and we very much appreciate uh, the chairman and the other uh, co-sponsors. 
It carefully balances opportunities for saving energy via high efficiency water heaters with the benefits to utilities of using uh, large electric water heaters and demand response and thermal storage programs. It allows for the continued manufacture of these large electric resistance water heaters, but with a variety of provisions to limit their use to homes participating in demand response and thermal storage programs. Um, the bill also provides guidance so that DOE will carefully consider both energy efficiency and demand response uh, opportunities in future rulemakings. So as I said, we do uh, uh, support this bill. We also recommend that this committee consider other energy efficiency bills. We hope that this is just the beginning of what we, we think could be a very productive uh, uh, Congress in terms of energy efficiency. So with that, I look forward to your uh, questions, and thank you for the opportunity to testify. Well, th thank you very much, Mr. Nadell, for that statement. At this time, I'd like to recognize Mr. Robin Roy, who is the Director for Building Energy Efficiency and Clean Energy Strategy at the Natural Resources Defense Council. Thank you very much for being with us, and you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the subcommittee. And thanks for the opportunity to share the views of the Natural Resources Defense Council on grid-enabled water heaters, which we believe present a promising opportunity for a more efficient, more economic, and ultimately lower emissions electricity system overall. We really appreciate your leadership on this issue and your sponsorship of this bill. In brief, NRDC supports H.R. 906 to allow continued production, use, and evaluation of grid-enabled water heaters. One of NRDC's top institutional priorities is creating and facilitating a clean energy future. And to that end, we've long supported and advocated for greater energy efficiency, greater productivity, and using federal energy uh, appliance standards as one tool in the portfolio for getting there. Given our longstanding support for stronger energy efficiency, it may seem surprising that we support this legislation, which allows for continued production of electric resistance water heaters that may use double or more the energy of a heat pump water heater that would otherwise uh, be required. But there's a good reason. Uh, we explored the opportunities. We talked to our colleagues here and, and many others in manufacturing and among utilities, and we found the case persuasive. We worked with these colleagues from manufacturing, utilities, other efficiency and environmental organizations, and we came up with an approach that delivers on the opportunity for efficiency savings, delivers on the opportunity for uh, grid interactive uh, water heating, demand response, and ancillary services. Uh, doesn't undermine the opportunities from the efficiency standards. Uh, this language is a product of that work. Uh, I have to say a, a bit of an aside. It, Sometimes a lot of folks get together, and it's, it's hard work to come up with something that, uh, that we can all agree on, we come with different perspectives. And sometimes that goes into an abyss. We never hear anything from it again. And it's, it's so pleasing to see something like HR 906. I really do appreciate the effort. It. We see the result of, of our hard work, and it kind of encourages us at NRDC to do more of that, reaching out to other parties. I really do appreciate that. I know I've burned some time on that, but it, it's really important. Uh, the key opportunity here is as my colleagues have already expressed, is the achievement of benefits at a system level. Federal energy appliance standards focus on the component level. We recognize the difference. We're looking towards having, uh, while maybe more energy use, having that energy use at more attractive times, lower cost, lower emissions, overall just a much better outcome. We're very keen on that. We recognize that that is the opportunity that's presented by this water heater energy storage, this large battery, as, uh, as my colleagues have said. We're very keen on it. One of the key elements of H.R. 906 that we're so, uh, so delighted by is that it allows for, really encourages much more analysis of consumer and environmental impacts from grid-enabled water heaters. It's built right in. There's so much to be learned about the effectiveness of these water heaters. Actually, there's so much to be learned about not just grid-enabled water heaters, but about heat pump water heaters and what, uh, what might be done to optimize our energy use, delivering the greatest consumer and environmental outcomes. We're at a really early stage analytically. It's inherently complex. There are a lot of other water heater technologies existing and emerging. Conditions in uh, Gary and Mr. Connett's area are different from conditions in the Pacific Northwest, and those are different from those in, in, the, in the South. Getting the analysis right is not always that easy. But it's really worth doing uh, for water heaters. They are 15% or more of residential energy use. They're big. If we get this one right, even small improvements can deliver great 
consumer and environmental uh, outcomes. One issue that is often on some people's minds is whether this grid-enabled water heater legislation will pose a problem for heat pump water heaters. We don't think that's, that's the case. Uh, we think that grid-enabled water heaters, this legislation, it, will fo it focuses on a fairly small market segment where heat pump water heaters may not be most well-suited. And in fact, the, the, the attention to water heating, the, uh, the further analysis that will come from this may actually end up delivering much more advanced in all sorts of water heater technologies, both in, in the development of technologies and understanding them and in deploying them through good utility programs and consumer choices. Uh, I think that's really pretty much all I want to say. I can talk a little bit more about our, our long and abiding love for federal energy standards as one of the tools in the portfolio that give us a more efficient economic future but I think it's already on the record pretty well. Appreciate the opportunity. Well, Mr. Roy, thanks uh, very much, and thanks for being here. Uh, at this time, we'll ask questions, and I would like to recognize myself for five minutes. Uh, first of all, I was not aware that uh, hot water heaters were the largest users of electricity in most homes, and I think someone did say that. But, Mr. Cope, I think you're involved in the manufacture of water heaters, and Let's say we're not successful in adopting 906. Would uh, a heat pump, a heat pump uh, water heater uh, that would be manufactured under the new regulation, would that be more expensive than the heat-resistant water heater that is currently being used? Um, uh, Chairman, thank you for the question. Uh, yes, it would. Uh, large capacity heat pump water heaters in general will be about twice the cost of, of um, a large capacity electric resistance water heater. You add the compressor cost and the installation cost and uh, it, it's more expensive by about a factor of two. So it, 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 it does have a cost impact. Um, the question has it also been asked about whether heat pump water heaters can be grid enabled and grid interactive. Uh, the technology is taking us in that direction but you know, in the short term uh, we're, we're just not there yet. Um, we, there's, there's important work to do in that area, but uh, uh, right now the grid-enabled large capacity yeah. units are the tools that we need. So what would be the, if you double the cost, what kind of cost are we talking about for a large hot water heater? Well, uh, I was, an 80-gallon heat pump water heater is going to be in the $1,500 range. $1,500. At, at retail. Yeah. Um, I think that... Uh, and, and 80 gallon is, is, the, is the small end of the range. Generally, with, with large capacity units for, for mm -hmm. thermal storage, you know, you, you'll mm -hmm. see 100 gallon, our, mm -hmm. and we're gearing up to build 120 <coughs> pump water heaters. Yeah. So we're, we're moving in that direction. Yeah. Well, without getting too technical and just for layman's understanding, why is it that a heat resistant water heater is more compatible with demand response than a heat? I mean, the heat pump would be more would be less compatible than a heat resistant? Well, it, it has to do with the ability to control the wattage of, of the element. Uh, you know, the, the, finer, the finer element control enables a lot of the ancillary services in terms of frequency control and other things that, that, the, uh, that the independent system operators are willing to compensate for. So um, to, the, to the extent that we can control those elements, we can provide these services. Um, the heat pump water heater with the compressor, we can't vary element wattage to the compressor. Um, turning a compressor on and off in short periods of time shortens compressor life. It's just not a real compatible technology for the fine level of control that we can achieve with elements. Right. And Mr. Conrad, what do you think would be the overall impact for electric co-ops around the country if we're not successful in passing this legislation? Mr. Chair, a, a lot of the electric cooperatives have a fair amount of electric water heaters in their service <coughs> territory today. We might call those uncontrolled water heaters. A lot of the co-op service territory doesn't have natural gas. It has propane as an option. And in many of those areas, the, the, the choice for heating water would be an electric water heater. It's less expensive yeah. to operate than a propane one. Okay. And so if those were all to go in without any control capability, we're going to add to our peak demands. And if we start to add to our peak demands, that means additional cost to our consumers. It means additional uh, emissions, emission, additional fuel costs, additional power plants potentially. Yeah. And so having this ability to have a water heater that's a large volume water heater that allows us to take that entire electric load and shift it to an off-peak period is, is, is 
good for our memberships and good for our co-ops. Okay. Well, I want to thank all of the groups that work together. You know, we have a lot of issues up here in which there are strong philosophical differences, and the only way we're going to move forward is for uh, groups to recognize, including those of my side, we can't always get everything we want, and that's why the regular order is so important. So thank you all for working together on this, and hopefully we can uh, pass this legislation. And I, at this time, I'd like to yield five minutes to the gentleman from Illinois. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Nadell, in the initial legislative effort to address this grid and naval water heater issue, you actually testified before the Senate Energy and Resources Committee in June of last year, June of 2013, rather, expressing your organization's concern over the legislative language proposed at the time, which you asserted uh, would, and I quote, allow widespread use of less electric, less efficient water heaters and applications without off-peak water heating or load management, end of quote. Since that time, your organization has been brought to the negotiating table and actually helped draft the new language contained in this bill. Can you speak to your organization's involvement in drafting this new language, language and have your fears been addressed in the current bill that we have before us today? Um, yes, uh, thank you for bringing that up. Yes, our concerns have been addressed. In fact, after that hearing, uh, some of the people here in this room came up to me and said, can we talk, can we try to work something out? The bill originally basically just allowed unlimited sales of these water heaters for any application. We've, as you've heard in the uh, testimony here, the bill has a number of provisions to effectively limit its use to those households where there is a demand response to thermal storage program. With those limitations and those protections, and I described them in more detail in my written testimony, we are very comfortable with this bill. It allows demand response programs, but doesn't allow widespread leakage. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Roy, are you convinced that this bill will have a positive impact on both consumers and the environment by allowing the use of grid-enabled water heaters? Yes, I am, sir. I, I believe the light that is will be shown on this opportunity uh, for grid-enabled water heaters, the analysis that will come with it, will focus a lot of attention. So we'll, we'll get benefits not just directly from the, uh, from the application of grid-enabled water heaters, as they are called for here, but we will have, uh, I think we'll have more utilities, more demand response uh, service providers and aggregators for utilities. I see that we have a representative from Pennsylvania, uh, PJM, transmission organization in the room here today, we'll have much more attention on the broader set of opportunities that are available in water heating. Uh, I think the, uh, the direct and spillover effects both will, can be great from this. I know my organization will be working hard with all these parties to see what can we do now that we have something that's powerful and productive in this, in this space, how can we really work forward and, and help utilities with their programs, help cons deliver better consumer and environmental outcomes. Thank you. Uh, let me ask uh, across the table there, is there anyone who has any concerns that this bill, with this bill and think that it may have unintended consequences that we have not covered today? Does anyone of you all think that there are anything that we haven't focused on, that we haven't covered, that may have an unintended cons consequence that we should be aware of? No one. I think we always find some unintended consequences in most things we do, either as actions or through inaction. Mm -hmm. uh, what's important is that we are aware of it, we're responsive, and we work forward. What we have here is a, uh, an industry segment and a degree of attention that I think will help us all address any unintended consequences in a timely fashion and, and deal with those and move on to the great opportunities that are available. Mr. Chairman, with that, I yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman yields back. This time I recognize the gentleman from West Virginia, Mr. McKinley, five minutes. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and, and thank you for having this hearing. Um, I'm curious back on the, the, the comment that uh, I think it was you, Mr. Cope, said about the uh, uh, heat pump water heater at, at around the cost of it, $1,500. Uh, also, the labor would be a little higher, too, wouldn't it, installing that? 
Yes, insulation costs with heat pump water heaters are generally higher than electric resistance. And so, building on that, uh, what what kind of payback? What 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 is some what should someone expect to pay back on that? On a heat pump water heater, in general. Yes, in gen ten years, fifteen years. Um, I think in in the marketplace today, uh, there are a lot of incentives uh, for heat pump water heaters. And, and generally, heat pump water heaters are operating at twice the efficiency of electric resistance. So most of our experience is with 50-gallon heat pump water heaters replacing standard 50-gallon electric resistance. And I think payback is less than five years. Even in, um, in, uh, in a place other than in West Virginia, our, we're, we're probably paying around $0.07 cents a kilowatt hour. Uh, but in New York, it's nineteen twenty cents a kilowatt hour. So are you saying... Generally speaking, across the country, or are you talking? Well, general, about I'm saying that uh, there, there, as an example, in Iowa, there are a number of cooperatives that have $500 rebates on, on heat pump water here. So when they're buying down the cost of this technology, and that's what makes the, the, the payback period uh, more attractive. Um, in the Pacific Northwest, we've seen $900 rebates on, on heat pump water heaters. So that, that has helped to make them more cost effective and, and reduce, the, reduce the payback time. Um, but uh, the, the fact remains that, you know, Trying to control a water heater for a heat pump water heater for grid enabled grid enabled functionality, you know, that that has not been worked out yet, uh, okay. and, and that's Nadel. a major difficulty. Mr. Nato. Yes, uh, Department of Energy did examine the exact question uh, you ask, and they estimate the average uh, simple payback is six years for a heat Here. pump water heater. But that is the average. If it's uh, more expensive electricity, it'll be less. If it's only seven cents a kilowatt hour, it'll be more. Yeah. I think that's based on about eleven yeah. cents, as I recall, average. What's uh, Mr. Cope back on? Um, you know, we see some promotion. Um, we've um, my former firm. We had an architectural engineering practice, and we saw we were always being promoted to put those inline uh, electric units so that we weren't storing water. Um, how inefficient? We we didn't we never use those. But how inefficient are they to be able to have instant hot water instead of having a 50 or 100 gallon tank sitting there at 50, trying to maintain a, a low temp or a high temperature for a period of time? Is it how inefficient is it to have just the, simply the inline augmented? Well, the the inline or instantaneous electric water heating technology at, at an efficiency level is very high in terms of converting kilowatt hours you know, to BTUs. Uh, but the general consensus is that uh, whole house applications of Instantaneous electric or electric tankless, uh, they cause uh, they cause problems in terms of um, transformer sizing, uh, demand charges for for the home or the business, impacts for for the cooperative or the or the utility. Um, most most electric tankless technologies that I, that I refer to as point of use are the ones who have the best application because you can you can run one line to one location and put a put a point of use water heater in for a lavatory or, or for hand washing right. or something like that. But whole house applications have been problematic. Okay. Uh, the the uh, last question is more is about efficiency and where we're going. What, what should we be anticipating in the industry uh, should be the next uh, move in efficiency, whether it's hot water heaters or other appliances that we have in our households? What, what's the next generation of, of, of efficiency we should be anticipating? Well, I think heat pump water heater technologies will continue to to gain in efficiency uh, in five years. Um, you know, they've moved from 2.0 to somewhere over 3.0 uh, in, in terms of uh, performance factor, meaning that for every kilowatt hour you provide to that compressor, you can move three kilowatt hours worth of heat. So that's, I would say that's probably going to be the major improvement. I don't see a, a new major technology on the horizon. Um, I, I think that, you know, the introduction of, of water heaters to the Internet of Things and, and high-speed two-way communication to the appliance offer us uh, multiple levels of efficiencies that, that we can explore. But in terms of raw technology, you know, it, it's taken us 20, 25, 30 years to get heat pump water heaters into the market. Sure. Ms. Nato, do you have a comment about that? Um, I totally agree with that. I just expand slightly uh, for gas uh, water heaters. We have condensing water heaters. And during the break, a number of us were talking about opportunities to meld the water heater with the space heating and cooling systems combination appliances. So we I want to get a, eventually we've run out of our time, but I want to the condensing and non-condensing. I want to get. I'd, I'd like to have more discussion with that about that. Please. Thank you. If you'd meet Mr. Go McKinley back. right after the hearing to talk about that. 
This time I'd like to introduce and recognize the gentleman from New York, Mr. Tonko, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and welcome to our panelists. Uh, Mr. Connick, what are your estimates for savings uh, to the utility and to the customer, to consumers, uh, achieved through the use of demand response programs? Uh, thank you. The, in terms of the consumer, uh, we sell the energy that goes to these large capacity water heaters. We call them off-peak water heaters, if you will. We sell the energy to them at, at, at a fairly low price. And so they can heat their, their water for around $240 a year. Uh, and that compares to, say, propane. And, and propane is rather volatile, at least it is in Minnesota or has been. And so sometimes propane for that same amount of water could be five or six or $700 uh, cost. Mm -hmm. Uh, it would vary. In terms of natural gas, it would be competitive with natural gas. If you could uh, heat your water for 240 bucks, we'll do the same with, with, with an off-peak water heater. And the savings to the utility? No, those are savings to the consumer. In terms of the utility, it has to go back to this notion that uh, without these programs, we would, we would have to buy high-cost energy in the market. And the notion is, is that we have a peak at every utility every day. And that peak for a lot of co-ops occurs at supper time. It's when we're all home and we're having dinner. And by the way, that's usually the largest time uh, of water, hot water consumption. Mm -hmm. And so if all these water heaters were not able to, if we weren't able to control them, they're adding to our peaks and would have to build uh, peaking plants to serve that load or buy high cost energy. The cost to build a peaking plant for 100 megawatts is about uh, $80 million. Um, it, it gets fairly expensive to serve that peak power that we can avoid. I hear you. Thank you. What percentage of the demand response programs used by our rural co-ops are due to the use of electric uh, thermal storage devices? You know, I, I, I would say it this way, that that premier program for the co-ops, uh, demand-side management programs, is water heating. Okay. It, it's, it's by far the most uh, successful and in, in, in the most widespread program that we have. And, and in that regard, what proportion of your customers participate in the uh, demand response programs using electric uh, thermal storage? Y yes, uh, I can speak to Great River Energy. And, and uh, about 20% of our membership has a demand side uh, or demand response water heater. And just as to how the consumers benefit from the use of water heaters that are incorporated into a demand response program? Uh, again, for the consumer, it, it's cost savings. Um, they're not going to spend as much to heat hot water as they would otherwise. Okay. And uh, obviously the uh, ancillary piece of uh, the uh, avoidance of peak capacity plants that would have to be uh, ha have to be addressed. For Mr. Nadel and Mr. Roy, a question about water heaters and uh, the fact that they're replaced about every 15 years, often when they have failed. So consumers often need to make quick choices about a replacement. I have a few questions related to consumer purchasing. Will water heaters exempted from the standard be identified as such to the consumer? Yes, there's a requirement for a clear requirement for labeling that is permanent, uh, water resistant. Uh, okay. They will know for a long time. Also importantly, they, they won't be that readily available unless they're part of a utility program mm -hmm. because there's a, a lock and key arrangement required by the legislation. And then for either of you, will the consumer know that these products will not deliver more than 50 percent of hot water if they are not part of a utility demand response program? The warning label on it says they will only uh, operate properly. I don't think it gives the exact uh, details, but it does say they will not uh, operate properly unless enrolled in a program and enabled by uh, a technician associated with that program. But it doesn't mention a percentage. It just... Uh, no. Okay. And then consumers uh, do use the yellow energy usage information on appliances to make purchasing decisions. Do these labels need to reflect the dual nature of the energy usage of these systems? On the labels, they will have to talk about their current, uh, the energy use of these products under this typical test procedure, and they give a range of comparability. I have to look at the exact details of the Federal Trade Commission rules to say 
what will be on the uh, range of comparability uh, for these particular types of water heaters. And if they're not, if they're installed and are not part of a demand response system, aren't they less efficient than the identical appliance installed as part of a demand response program? Yes, they are not as efficient, uh, so they do use more power that is compensated for the ability to um, control them. But if you somehow defeat the protections, which are quite substantial, yes, you will get uh, higher energy use and you won't get the benefits. But we, I think, very carefully constructed it to minimize the chances of leakage. Okay. Gentlemen, I thank you. With that, Mr. Chair, my time is as, Okay. Uh, did, you, did you want to say anything, Mr. Cobb? You look like you were... Um, no, I, I, I don't have anything to add at this time. Thank okay. you. Okay. At this time, I'd like to recognize the gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Griffin, for five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. appreciate you all uh, being here and listening to your testimony today. It's making me think I should go out and get a new hot water heater uh, because mine clearly won't be, is not going to be nearly as efficient as uh, what you all are talking about. I am concerned about some things. Uh, the gentleman just brought up uh, the warning label. I do think that we probably need to take a look at that and see if we make sure we had let folks know that it will go to 50 percent uh, of efficiency if it's uh, tampered with. And the, the whole lock and key mechanism uh, concerns me some. I will tell you that when this was a part of a Senate amendment uh, to a House bill, I looked at it, and uh, fortunately the penalties are not uh, – do not include incarceration for trying to get around the system uh, by doing something something to the machine, but it does include a fine penalty, which causes me some concern. It always makes me nervous when we're mandating uh, things, and so I'm I'm trying to figure out. Um, mo and I know most consumers will just you know this is this is what is available on the market. Something happens, their plumber tells them this is what you need to buy. They'll buy that, or they'll go to the Home Depot and get something off the shelf. But if somebody really wants to have 100 gallons ready whenever they want it, what would keep them from buying 250-gallon hot water heaters under this program or this bill? There's, uh, thank you for the question. There's nothing that stops a consumer from, from buying two smaller capacity water heaters. There's nothing that prevents them from buying a commercial water heater and, and, and putting it into their residence. Um, you know, so the, well, let me ask that question because I'm, I'm trying to find answers and Anytime the government's mandating stuff, it makes me nervous. So if, if I wanted to buy a commercial hot water heater, this wouldn't be a problem? No. The, uh, this relates specifically to residential. This goes back to the DOE ruling, which is specifically for residential. But, if, but I could put a commercial hot water heater into my residence. My understanding, there's no law that prevents a homeowner from buying a commercial water heater, gas or electric, and putting it into their residence. Okay. Now, let me ask this because I know a lot of people will have this question too. I read uh, somewhere that uh, if you have the heat pump type water heater and it's in an area that is normally heated, it may actually uh, cool the air a little bit as well. Is that accurate? A heat pump water heater will cool and, and dehumidify the space that it resides in because it's pulling heat out of that, out of that space and putting it into the tank. Um, there are some ducting options that are being developed for heat pump water heaters that would allow them to pull outside air in and expel, um, you know, cool air. Uh, you know, so the technology is evolving in that direction. But the, most of the technology that's on the market today does cool and dehumidify the space that it resides in. Okay. And so when you say that the, the unit would cost more, um, if, you had to, if you had it, say, in the middle of your basement and you converted the basement or, or the house that had a basement converted into a living space, you'd have to spend some more money getting it, getting the outside air brought in so that you wouldn't cool your basement where perhaps your daughter has taken up residency. Just saying. No. Go ahead. Um, yes, a uh, good question. In fact, there was a study published just a few weeks ago in the Pacific Northwest looking at uh, this issue. It found that, yes, it does occur. It was relatively uh, rare. As I recall, they found out across a sample of homes with heat pump water heaters in the Northwest, relatively cold. Instead of getting a coefficient performance of 2 when you factor this in, it might be 1.9 or something right. on average. Let's translate that into the, the, that alleged the daughter's uh, bedroom area is uh, how much is the temperature going to drop? Are we talking one degree or are we talking, you know, she's going to notice 10 degrees cooler? 
Do we know? I should speak for Minnesota. Um, and, and we've installed a number of heat pump water heaters in employees' homes just to get a sense of how, do, how well they do work. And, and it's no doubt about it. In Minnesota, every, wa every water heater is in a basement, and those basements are conditioned, and we heat those basements. And so to put a heat pump water heater into, I'll call it the furnace room, it's going to cool that furnace room down quite a bit. It's been described as I can hang dead deer in there now. Uh, it, it, it's cold. And, and, and what it's doing, a heat pump water heater extracts heat from that room. That's what a heat pump does. It extracts heat and puts that heat into the water heater. Think of a refrigerator for a minute. That's extracting heat from inside the refrigerator and putting it into your kitchen. That's a heat pump in action. This is another heat pump. It's going to extract heat from its environment. You need a fairly, the, the heat pump manufacturers will tell you, you need so much area in your furnace room to have a heat pump water heater because it has to extract heat from that space, and it's going to condense it and squeeze it all together and put it into the water heater. So that mechanical room is going to be a little cool, and, and, and that might spill over into the family room or the living room down in the basement as well. All right. I do appreciate it. Uh, thank you all so much for being here. We're all trying to be more efficient, but we want to make sure we balance out uh, all the interests concerned. Thank you so much. I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Griffin. At this time, I recognize the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Green, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I'd like to have put my statement into the record, and I can go straight to questions. Uh, Mr. Roy, um, uh, I have some questions, and, and I have to admit, coming from Texas and refining and oil, we normally don't agree on with the NRDC, but today that's a different case. Does NRDC have a sense of why new efficiency standards were proposed by DOE? There have been a series of efficiency standards on increasing numbers. I was going to say over the years. O over the last 30, uh, yeah. 30 years or so, nearly. And so this is just an update? This is an update to uh, a standard that was uh, originally in legislation in, uh, in 1987, signed into law by President Reagan. Uh, this is an update on the water heater standards that were, were first put in then. In 1987, yeah, we would hope the technology has changed since then. So. The technology is moving at a fit. quick pace, but in part because of this. I think the, the, the major manufacturers now are introducing products, and, and Vaughn is introducing great new products in the heat pump water heater space and condensing gas uh, water heaters. It, it, it really is moving. Yeah. Um, your thoughts on the DOE proposed waiver authority for water heaters? Is that, uh, uh, I, is that something I'll support? We, we talked to the other stakeholders, the manufacturers, the utilities, uh, consumer groups, well, uh, uh, other efficiency environment groups, after it was brought to our attention that, that there was a, a challenge with, uh, with the DOE standard. And we, we heard what they said. It made sense to us. So we worked together to, uh, to support a waiver approach by DOE under their existing legislation. Uh, we would still like to see that, that move forward. Okay. Okay. Uh Mr. Cahope, in your position as National Utility Sales Manager, can you describe what the U.S. water heater market looks like? Um, for example, again, coming from Texas, we don't mind natural gas water heaters, although, you know, years ago everybody wanted an all-electric house, and we found out that may not be the best way to go. But, uh, example, how many natural gas versus uh, electric water heaters are sold? Is it, have we seen it in the last few years, particularly with the cost of natural gas cheaper? Um. I think that would have been expected, but from what I've seen from the industry numbers, it's 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 still roughly a half and half market. That that half is electric and and half is, is natural gas. It varies uh, greatly uh, by region. The Pacific Northwest is, is has much more electric water heating. If you go to California, it might be 95 percent gas. Uh, there's also a split between rural and and, and urban. Metro areas are usually more. Uh, uh, decidedly more gas water heating because natural gas is readily available. Pipelines are available and everything else. Yes. But on the national average that I've seen, it hasn't moved much from uh, just about a 50-50 a split between gas and electric, and that's sustained over the years. Okay. What's the standard size for a home now? Because I know uh, I've heard over the years our homes have gotten so much bigger in, uh, uh, compared to the last generation. Um, what size, uh, what's the standard size of a water heater now? Uh, the the fifty gallon electric is still the still the most popular size, and it, it you know it might be eighty or eighty five percent of the marketplace. But this is an uncontrolled um, fifty gallon electric water heater, generally not uh, not part of a demand response program or an off peak program because it, because of the size limitation. 
Yeah. On the gas side, I think the most popular historically has been the 40-gallon gas, uh, but I think that's moving both electric and gas seem to be moving slightly toward larger capacity units because we're building we're building larger houses um, yeah. and we have more we have more uses for hot water within the home. Yeah. Um, what are the market share for new technologies like the tankless and heat pump water heaters, pump heaters? Well, that's, uh, that, that's, that's a great question. Um, and we talk about that um, at the ACEEE Hot Water Forum uh, that, that they hold uh, fairly regularly. Um, uh, tankless gas technology was introduced roughly 15 years ago, and they spent a lot of money promoting that technology. And it's just within the last couple of years they've gotten about 5% market share, or now they might be slightly above that. So uh, you know, that concerted effort has, has, has garnered them some market share. Uh, heat pump water heaters as a generally available technology has only been in the market about five years. And, and after five years, they're just approaching or have just gone over the 1% market share um, mark. So it, despite all the best efforts and the money and the promotion and, and the education efforts, uh, there, there, there seems to be a, um, a regular schedule for technology adoption by, by the American public. It, you know, nobody's running out to buy the, the newest water heater. People buy a water heater when they need one. When they need it, yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, it's, it's, given that the DOE standards take effect next month, have the supply chains for um, larger water heaters closed down, or do you think that's it? Because sometimes when the uh, standards change, uh, the supply is not there because the plants haven't been doing it. Do you think there's a neat enough supply to match with what the DOE is doing? Um, well, I, I think the, the supply chains are beginning to be impacted. Um, a lot of the electric cooperatives and utilities that buy product directly for their programs mm -hmm. uh, had, had pre-ordered in order to um, put in a, a, a stock of, of, of qualifying products so that when the uh, rule goes into effect, they would not be immediately impacted. In terms of the, the manufacturers and the supply chains, they're already making the, making the changes. Um, we're Vaughn is a very small manufacturer. Uh, you know the, the big players in the industry, A.O. Smith and Ream. You know they're they're eighty percent or more of the water heating market w with two companies, and you know so their uh, their production facilities. You know they they can they can stop building large capacity residential, but they'll still be building large capacity commercial units. So the impact will not be that great. Okay. I know I'm over time. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Notice how patient we are, Mr. Green. Well, that concludes uh, the questions today, and I want to thank the panel for joining us and for your input and working with us in trying to formulate this legislation, and we look forward to working with you as we move forward. And we'll keep the record open for 10 days uh, for any material that needs to be inserted, and that will conclude today's hearing. Thank you very much. Thank you. Of course, it's stays stable. Eighty percent of replacements, gas lines there, the electric. You know, the yeah, there. yeah. And, and it's an emergency. Yeah. You don't don't uh, spend two days to explain it. Uh, new technology to me now. I need hot water. But, but the, the, the the flywheel is pretty good about that percent electric and percent gas. Yeah, it seems to be.